two young lives now measured in minutes. And an enemy Australia has never faced before. This was just an ambush. The crime that has left us wondering who we've become. Both files, both arms, both charging around. As we go inside the ambush. There's a whiz and a crack to a bullet as it moves, as it passes over the top of your head. They came to kill us. Into the minds of the killers. And we killed them. He believed that governments were trying to control people's minds. And those they targeted. You wear the blue uniform, doesn't make you superhuman. Tonight, our frontline experts join us for a special investigation. Having extremist beliefs is not in itself a crime. How do you predict when these thoughts then become actions? How do ordinary people become cold-blooded killers? I think this hits on every Australian's fear that this is someone that you know. In this world of deepening conspiracies, are we facing a new threat? A direct threat to social cohesion in Australian communities. Good evening, I'm Liz Hayes, and this is Under Investigation. And a warning some might find tonight's episode confronting. It's a peaceful summer afternoon in central Queensland. Christmas is just two weeks away. On their way to a routine welfare check are police officers Matthew Arnold and Rachel McCrow. In an hour, they'll be dead. A scarred piece of Queensland bush with the evidence of a cold-blooded ambush. By day's end, so will four others. Shot five, another shot five. Joining me to analyse one of the deadliest shootings to take police officers' lives, Dr John Coyne, a veteran intelligence officer who's worked in the military and law enforcement. You look at pictures like this, that looks more like somewhere there's been a heavy contact between military forces. Decorated former New South Wales detective Gary Jubelin, who ran the crime scene at Sydney's terrifying Lint Cafe siege. No one knew exactly what they were walking into. There could have been 10 people there. You just don't know. It's an active shooter situation. Renowned clinical psychologist Tamara Cavanagh, who specialises in trauma and PTSD. If you're adding hate-filled and more and more concerning conspiracy theories into the mix, if you believe one, you will likely believe another. And Matt Condon, award-winning crime author and journalist who knows the Queensland back blocks where our investigation takes us tonight. This is the sharp end of policing. This is as bad as it gets when two of your own are, are murdered in cold blood. Following Matthew Arnold and Rachel McCrow that afternoon are two other young police constables, Keely Bruff and Randall Kirk. They've been told it's a welfare check on a missing person. Police had completed a routine risk assessment before travelling to the property. Their destination, a remote house near Weambilla, four hours west of Brisbane. Inside the house, Gareth Train, his wife Stacy, and brother Nathaniel. Stacy and Nathaniel had been teachers, a profession that would not have raised any serious red flags. Even Gareth, although living off the grid, had briefly been a community child support officer. But on that December day, they were preparing a private apocalypse. The four constables have no idea what's awaiting them. John, from your knowledge and what we know about this, this was a routine event? Look, I think it was. On any given day across Australia, law enforcement officers, our police in our communities, are called out to do check welfares, to pursue warrants, etc. 
In this case, they were targeting someone who had no substantive criminal history, it would appear. If we looked at it, OK, they were teachers in the education area. Um, even if you delve that a little bit deeper, you'd assume they'd gone through working with vulnerable people checks. So there's a whole heap of things here that would turn around and say that this was a low-risk activity. You know, they were doing what Australian police officers do really, really well, which is serving the community, checking on the welfare of someone. As a police officer in the environment like that, I would have been comfortable sending them out for police officers in that circumstances based on the information I'm aware of that they, they had at their disposal. It's a fairly straightforward job, but they wouldn't have had a sense of the threat that was just around the corner. What would have told you when you arrived, this is not normal? Well, the gate closed, but it's, um, it's a rural area. Police encounter that in uh, you know, country areas all the time. And that had a warning sign and, on it? And the warning sign. And, uh, you know, again, that's not unusual. You go in there, private property, keep off. But you're the police. You go in there to make an inquiry, and they would have gone in there with that attitude. Let's just find out what's in there. It was 4.30 in the afternoon when the four officers, all under the age of 30, approached the property. To put this into context, going to a property at Wiambilla is not like an officer knocking on a door in Balmain or the Dandenongs or Spring Hill in Brisbane for a welfare check. You have to understand this region. It's different from the rest of Australia. Because of the remoteness, it became areas where cannabis was grown and produced, and certainly in the late 80s, there was a methamphetamine scene there as well. This is not your usual policing environment. Led by Constable Matthew Arnold and Constable Rachel McCrow, the group walk up the driveway. It's believed CCTV cameras positioned along the route have alerted the trains to their visitors. As the police make their way, Gareth and his brother Nathaniel lie in wait, camouflaged and positioned with one purpose in mind. At no point, I wouldn't imagine, they would have been anticipating what they were about to be confronted with. Without warning, a volley of shots. Suddenly, all hell breaks loose. The rifle fire or the sound of gunshots, that would have just been so loud. Time would have stopped still for them when that, that noise was heard in, the, in a location like that. It would have been a terrifying situation for them. There's a whiz and a crack to a bullet as it moves. A whiz as it's moving towards you, the crack as it passes over the top of your head. They would have felt fear, because that's what people have got to understand. You wear the blue uniform, doesn't make you superhuman. And we know in those moments you get a narrowing of attention. We know time slows down. We know that anxiety goes through the roof. They are still having every human response the rest of us would have. There is nothing that truly protects you from a human response. In a few murderous minutes, Matthew Arnold and Rachel McCrow are dead. You become a bit disgruntled and, and seasoned as a detective as long as I was. If there's a gun battle with a hardcore crook, a gangster or whatever, you accept that. That's, that's part and parcel. This was just an ambush. The two other officers attempt to take cover. Constable Randall Kirk is shot as he runs back to their police vehicle. Under mortal threat, he has no option but to try to escape. Incredibly, in the circumstances, despite receiving direct fire at his vehicle, he gets away, desperately trying to raise the alarm. But still on the train's property, Keeley Bruff, who has only been a police officer for eight weeks, is facing her own hell. A police officer trying to avoid being shot and hiding out, moving, moving, moving. What a terrifying experience, not knowing if you're going to make it that day. She's now being hunted by the train brothers who've set a fire to flush her out. My heart stops. If I'm that young woman, my heart stops. She's in the grass, and that's... I mean, what, what is she thinking? You've got fear and adrenaline running. Most people would never experience that level of fear and adrenaline. She's got no idea where her partners are. 
In the smoke and in her terror, Keeley still manages to text news of the ambush to police. The fact that she managed to stay calm enough to text and communicate, she could have uh, just got up and panicked, but uh, full, full credit to her. I mean, to my mind, she is an example of spontaneous <coughs> valour. And I think there were a number of examples in this incident that simply rose up to meet the circumstances. She's texting goodbye. She's, she's calling for help, but she's also texting her family. We know that when people are under extreme adrenaline and in these types of situations, that they very much believe that you're not going to make it. It's quite likely that she didn't anticipate getting out and her first thoughts are to her family, which is very common. She hasn't surrendered, but she thinks her time's up. Look, she's young, she's isolated, she's alone. Um, she's in a circumstance where her call for help, she would know, is a substantial time away. And she would also know that they haven't attended knowing that there would be any risk. So I think the combinations of that, you quite likely think you're not gonna make it. Hiding in the grass, it's not uh, cover, it's just concealment. So yeah, if they spotted her. But um, she, she knows she's being hunted. Yeah, it's like a horror movie, isn't it? Um, yeah, uh, no. it, it really is. Coming up... They don't know what they're up against. Keely Bruff's text for help... They knew there was reports of multiple gunfire, but they didn't know what they were walking into. ...spark a deadly showdown. There was an absolute intent to murder the people, and as civilians, you go, oh, my God. That's next on Under Investigation. Tonight, we're going inside the ambush. A horrifying crime that has made us stop and question who we've become and where we're going. Three everyday Australians have turned to terrorism and are seemingly determined to end this day in December last year in a long and bloody battle. Constable Keely Bruff, only eight weeks into the job, is being hunted by Gareth and Nathaniel Train, who've lit a fire to flush her out. They've already murdered two of her fellow officers. She's texting vital information to police and saying goodbye to her family. A police officer trying to avoid being shot and hiding out, moving, moving, moving. What a terrifying experience, not knowing if you're going to make it that day. Keeley's partner, Constable Randall Kirk, has been shot in the leg, but narrowly escaped and is also raising the alarm. But soon, there will be one more victim. Noticing the smoke and fire, two neighbours also come running. One of them, Alan Dare, is shot. He came along to help. He was serving the community too. He thought there was trouble there and came to help and he lost his life. Word of this unfolding horror is out. Queensland police know they're facing a war, but they're unsure of the enemy and how many there are. That's a complex thing to have to respond to. People would be trying to work out exactly what's happened We've got the young policewoman hiding, fire, worrying about getting burnt to death, thinking she's going to be burnt to death or, or shot and killed by these people. Passing on information, so you're getting that information, then people have got to assemble the resources. And you've got a neighbour down. You've, you've got the, got the neighbour down. No one knew exactly what they were walking into. There could have been 10 people there. You just don't know. It's an active shooter situation. But who are the killers? Gareth, Nathaniel and Stacey Train, a perplexing and deeply disturbing trio. Not only for what they are on this bloody day, but who they were. Nathaniel Train was a former school principal and Stacey Train was a former school teacher. Well, if I was looking at a risk assessment, part of it would be, have they got a career? 
oh, they're teachers, they've been teaching primary schools. Okay, well that sort of shifts the uh, the threat level a little bit. They're teachers, so we leave them in a room with children and they're responsible for educating kids. Nathaniel and Stacey were apparently popular with their students, but they were also anti-vaxxers and left their jobs in part because of their beliefs. The school teacher part is one part that's shocking. The other part is, is that people want the bad guys to look like bad guys. You know, we want, we want them to, in police terminology, you know, we want the grubs to look like grubs, you know. In an intriguing love triangle, Stacey married Nathaniel, but divorced him to marry his brother, Gareth, and live on his remote Queensland property. But when COVID lockdowns occurred, Nathaniel illegally crossed the border and moved in with them. All three were followers of extreme conspiracy theories. You've got three people acting that way? That's, I, I find that interesting from a police point of view. Like, we'll find one person that's an extremist and maybe a history of violence, but you've got three people that, for all intents and purposes, have on the surface looked like they've been going about their business in a relatively normal way, and they've come together with this one, uh, one goal. Most people would say they were mentally ill. Yeah, look, you definitely don't want to equate violence with mental illness. There's no research that strongly supports a link there. And in fact, um, people with mental illness have um, largely no greater chance of being violent than anyone else. So um, I think we want to think that people who would do things like this are mentally ill because that makes us feel like there's an explanation. Um, but in fact, uh, you know, the group mentality actually is the part that doesn't surprise me we can push people to think certain things and group situations are highly risky for that. So... Kind of like a cult. Very similar to cult-like behaviours. As police later discovered, spiralling deep into the dark online world of conspiracies, Gareth, Stacey and Nathaniel Train had become fanatical believers in an apocalyptic form of Christianity. Either defend your children until your last breath, or answer for your cowardice. They saw the police as demons and the COVID pandemic as one of the signs that the world was ending. The beginning of sorrows, when there shall be much lamentation. The beginning of famine, when many shall perish. The beginning of wars. I think the terrible irony of this is that with the trains, they actually brought upon their own end of days, which fulfilled their own prophecy. It's now around 5.15 p.m. at the train's Weambilla property. The arrival of the first police responders enables Keely Bruff to make her escape. Then at 7.39 p.m., Gareth and Stacey Train post an eerie and disturbing video to YouTube. They came to kill us. And we killed them. They're in the darkness. You can barely see their faces. They don't seem frantic. Cam Wilson from crikey.com.au joins our investigation. Within hours of their attack on police, he began tracking the train's digital trail. If you don't defend yourself against these devils and demons, you're a coward. They're sending a message to another, actually international Christian kind of conspiracy theorist. Their conspiracy contact is allegedly this man, an American known as Don. It's their last message as a way of saying that we did the right thing. We had, you know, acted out on the police, the demons who'd come to their property, and they're saying their final goodbye. We'll see you when we get home. We'll right. see you at home, Don. Love you. At 9pm, the elite Queensland Police Special Emergency Response Team, known as CERT, arrives. I think they did a remarkable job, this special response team. This has happened. Everyone has to marshal. 
be organised, have a strategy. You can't just bowl in there with guns blazing. How are we going to most efficiently eliminate the threat in this situation? At around 9.30 p.m., the CERT team breaches the property and moves in. In the darkness, a Bearcat armoured rescue vehicle. Taking the Bearcat or the armoured vehicle closer to the property where they could speak to them is certainly a tactic that would have been employed. Peter Dean is a former commander of counter-terrorism and special tactics operations like the one mounted against the trains. There would have been, I'm sure, an attempt to negotiate. They probably would, would have expected that that was probably going to fail, but the bottom line is they would have attempted it because there's always a chance that there can be a peaceful negotiation. Police have not released details of whether the CERT team did try to negotiate with the trains. Is there anything that would have said to you from what you've seen the trains were up for negotiation? So from um, the information you know, I've seen, I, I can't see any indication that they would have actually taken on negotiation. That doesn't mean that they wouldn't have, but given the degree of threat and the way they had set things up, it's more suggestive that they were very much preparing for something that they saw as inevitable. The main POI is now at the rear of the utility. Guided by police helicopters, the CERT team approaches. Turning night into day, the trains illuminate an intense hunting light. Would they be thinking, this is the moment? Yes. So it's very, come. This is, this is the day. Very much. So this is everything we've been talking about. This is exactly what we expected. You know, let's act. And very much a dehumanising of the people on the other end. So they're, and Because they're the enemy. They're the enemy. So across time, you slowly dehumanise the other side so that they're not really people. The trains who believe the world is ending seem to have no hesitation in playing their role in that doomsday scenario. By this stage, it appears that they're armed with three weapons. A 3006, which is a high-powered military cartridge, but also used a hunting cartridge. A 22 rimfire, which is a small calibre, limited penetration. A 12-gauge shotgun, plus two 9mm pistols removed from the officers. The CERT team is ready for a battle it intends to win. They don't know what they're up against. They didn't have a, a clear idea of that exactly. They knew there was reports of multiple gunfire, but they didn't know what they were walking into. At around 10 p.m., the assault begins. You know, this was a gun battle. Let, let's be really very clear on this. Those active shooters were shooting to the very moment they passed away. Gareth Train is reportedly the first to be killed. Down on the then Nathaniel. Number two is down. And Stacy Train, shot dead as she was firing at police. The sun rose on a war zone. The police armoured vehicle evidence of the train's fanatical ferocity. I mean, it still gives you a shudder to actually look at that vehicle with the pock marks in the <laughs> front screen. I mean, there was an uh, absolute intent to murder the people in that vehicle. Uh, the evidence is there. And as civilians, you go, oh, my God. Look, I'm, I'm with Matt on this one. That was an intent, you know, like a murderous intent. It was over. Six people were dead, and the nation was left reeling. The police were devastated that a civilian and two of their young officers had been killed. You've treated police officers. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're experiencing trauma. They're trained, but they're traumatised. Yeah, aren't so they? I think, you know, we can, as a civilian, say, well, this is a job, you signed up for it, this is part of it. But the actual reality is, it's not why they signed up. They signed up to protect people, to help people. And at the end of the day, they witness things most of us can never imagine. 
Coming up... You have to kill us. What turned teachers... They did not believe that the laws of Australia applied to them. ...into terrorists. What we do know is someone who believes one conspiracy theory will believe another. That's next on Under Investigation. Tuesday, December the 13th, last year. Australia has woken to the news of a horrific ambush. The scene is quite unimaginable, it's distressing. The bullet holes throughout the home, signs of the intensity of the firefight. This was a moment where the nation's psyche was traumatised. Absolutely. It didn't matter where you were in Australia, you heard about this. You connected with it and you felt like it was very close to home. You know, these were young people. It was just very shocking. Two young police officers murdered. Those officers uh, did not stand a chance. Two others narrowly escaped in terrifying circumstances. To think they survived the scene uh, let alone then got out to make phone calls and call for assistance was just extraordinary. And a concerned neighbour gunned down. It will be described by Queensland Police as a religiously motivated terror attack. The train family members subscribe to what we'll call a broad Christian fundamentalist belief system known as pre-millennialism. It was a belief that Christ will return to the earth for a thousand days and provide peace and prosperity, but it will be preceded by a period of time of tribulation, widespread destruction and suffering. Within probably 24, 48 hours after the event, I started to think, well, this is not terrorism. This is just a shocking, horrific act of violence by three people for some unknown reason. Peter Dean is a former New South Wales police counter-terrorism specialist. Since then, there has been a lot of research done and it now tells me that the word terror is plainly part of what occurred. So in most people's mind, it is a terrorist event. The focus of that research and our investigation tonight is how did former school teachers become ruthless killers? I think this hits on every Australian's fear that this is someone that you know, that anyone is capable of it. You would never pick these people out. Nathaniel Train, a former headmaster. His brother Gareth, who'd briefly been a community child support officer. And Stacey, married first to Nathaniel, then to Gareth, also a former school teacher. I think we like to think that it's someone who's uneducated or, you know, of a particular type, and this really came at our fear centres of this can be anyone. The Banquet of the Beast. The voice of Stacey Train. The main course is your choice of roast false religion or idolatrous ideology accompanied by lashings of lies. Sometimes they have to kill us. This is Gareth Train, a month before the murders. They have to kill us because they can't break our spirit. In multiple videos and online postings, there is evidence of the train's descent into the world of conspiracy. Brought up in conservative Christian churches, Gareth, Stacey and Nathaniel became more obsessive during the COVID lockdowns. But Gareth in particular had spent some years spiralling deeply into the dark online world. Compliance, compliance, compliance. To turn you into a soulless, spiritless, demonic meat suit. We know that Gareth Train had been involved in conspiracy online communities going back nearly two decades. In the immediate aftermath of the ambush, K2 
Pam Wilson from crikey.com.au tracked Gareth Train's digital trail and the deteriorating mind of a murderer. He said that he was inspired by the Port Arthur massacre. All the dead and injured were shot during a ruthless shooting spree by a lone gunman. He believed that it was not a real event. He believed that it was a false flag and that it was used to take away the guns of Australians. Our online investigation of the trains reveals that during the COVID lockdown, they were extreme anti-vaxxers, drawn to a wide variety of conspiracy theories. What we do know is someone who believes one conspiracy theory will believe another. So if you're adding hate field and more and more concerning conspiracy theories into the mix, if you believe one, you will likely believe another. The trains seemingly had a wide array of conspiracy beliefs. They had anti-vaccine views. They believed that uh, COVID was a, a government attempt to have population control. They also had this sovereign citizen ideology. You know, they did not believe that the laws of Australia applied to them. It's a phenomenon that has played out on Australian streets. With often confrontational anti authority protests. Absolutely, COVID and the uncertainty that everyone was feeling at that time. It starts to make you feel so anxious and so uncertain, you seek out some type of certainty to put things back in order. We don't have freedom of speech. Anything we see on Facebook is deleted. And, you know, we were frequently warning people at that time that conspiracy theories were going to be likely to take greater hold. I could understand that someone that's a little bit slightly paranoid or whatever, now this is Big Brother taking over the police. They're telling us to stay in the home. Curfews. I never thought I'd see it in our, our day where a curfew was implied. That type of thing. If someone is teetering of, you know, having that dislike or distrust of authority, police represented that. So that authority that we had as police officers has diminished, I think, because of the way that the uh, police were deployed for uh, the COVID. I think Gary's absolutely right, and not just the police, it, it was also uh, the unprecedented scenario whereby the government and various governments around Australia were telling their citizens how to live. This is when you're allowed to move and not move. This is what you have to do. And that's an unusual, incredibly unusual scenario, but the vast majority of Australians accepted it for what I would call the, the communal good. The government just recently told me that if I don't get vaccinated, I lose my teaching okay, job. Okay, okay. But the small percentage who already are paranoid about too much government power, this was almost the perfect storm. This was tangible evidence that my theories are correct. The government's gone too far. They're trying to control my life and take away my freedom. Extensive evidence analysed by Queensland Police led them to the conclusion that the trains held apocalyptic beliefs. Behold, famine and plague, tribulation and anguish are sent as scourges for the correction of men. With COVID as one of the signs that the world was ending, that finally pushed them into becoming terrorists. All of that analysis has provided us significant information and understanding about what drove the motivation of the train family members on that day. And our assessment has concluded that Nathaniel, Gareth and Stacey Train acted as an autonomous cell and executed a religiously motivated terrorist attack. But is it just the beginning? A new national security threat? They came to kill us. They might kill them. Veteran Intelligence Officer Dr John Coyne believes it is. International security threat, I think right-wing extremism, conspiracy theories and um, sovereign citizens represent a direct threat to social cohesion in Australian communities and continue to do so. Coming up... I do think this incident is a portal into another mindset. How do we deal? We have no clear predictor of who will and who won't. 
with the enemy within. How do we police it? How do you predict when these thoughts then become actions? That's next on Under Investigation. The shocking terrorist attack by Gareth, Nathaniel and Stacey Train on December the 12th last year represents a new and deadly threat to Australia's security, according to our experts. I think it's a national security threat. I think right-wing extremism, conspiracy theories and sovereign citizens represent a direct threat to social cohesion in Australia's communities and continue to do so. Hear my words, O oh my people. Prepare for battle and in the midst of the calamities be like strangers on the earth. Behold, God is the judge. But to the outside world, the trains didn't seem out of the ordinary. So what to do when the enemy lives in plain sight? How do we police it? Well, I think what it does is present a problem that when we're looking at people, that if that's their ideology, where does that turn into an actual threat? How do you predict when that's, these thoughts then become, become actions? And from a, a law enforcement point of view, that's a difficult part. I think that nails it. And I, this is a discussion we uh, have quite often in policy circles. You're not the thought police. We can't be in every young person's bedroom. We can't be in everyone's lounge room. We can't access every single phone or computer that is available. You know, my argument, censorship and, and legislation and regulation and policing of thought is not where the direction we want to go. The terror carried out by the trains is as hard to predict as acts of Islamic terror by so-called lone actors, as we saw during the siege at Sydney's Lint Cafe. It's the lone actor that gets involved in that is our major concern, the lone actor, because by the nature of the lone actor, they're not doing anything in concert with somebody else. Peter Dean, former New South Wales Police Assistant Commissioner in charge of counter-terrorism, believes it's online where people like the trains and individuals feed and fester. Yes, the, uh, the tragic events in Queensland involve three people, but we're continually concerned in this country and, and, and I know in North America and the UK um, and New Zealand about the lone actor because they are the, the people that uh, can end up committing something without anybody knowing they were going to do it. So what does it take to go from having an alternative thought to violence? What's the step? So I think the actual answer is we don't know. We have no clear predictor of who will and who won't. Um, you can look at individuals and you can look to see a history of violence and that will predict a future you know, violence. So at an individual level, you can certainly see things, but we know that just believing in any set of beliefs, um, any set of ideologies is not a predictor at all. Police are appealing for public assistance to locate a missing man. Nathaniel Train had illegally entered Queensland during COVID and he'd come to police attention for ramming a border gate and dumping two unregistered guns. But none of that, Queensland police say, was enough to change how officers approached the property. This is a fellow who'd been a principal of a high school. He had no other criminal history other than, I think he had a driving offence, uh, some even earlier than you know, many years ago. Um, so there was nothing to indicate to the members that would have attended on that day that they were going to be ambushed. Could I propose this? If we were presented with all the evidence we now know about the trains and this incident hadn't happened, how would we deal with it? We've got the expertise here. How would you deal with it? Like, OK, well, he's angry about this. 
how do you mitigate the potential risk? He has it's a, a, you know, going, you know yourself, you know, he has and from your experience, if that day hadn't ever occurred, there's yeah. nothing to police. Exactly. That, that's, you know what I mean? So there's nothing to police. They did nothing wrong. That's always that, been the problem, though, hasn't it? That, You've got to wait for something bad to happen. Uh, look, trying to predict, and we've got psychologists here saying, so I can't predict, we can't predict. So there, there's flags, there's indicators, but there's no certainty about it. And that's a trick from a law enforcement point of view. At what point do you step in? We tested just how easy it is to be lured into what's being called the echo chamber of conspiracy online. We asked a new user to search alternative anti-authority videos on the social media site TikTok. The app's algorithm, noting the activity, began recommending similar videos, telling of demons, the disruptor called Sam, and evil institutions a secret government that would cause the collapse of society, and warning that the apocalypse is coming. Is God speaking to us? In less than an hour, our user's feed was filled with extreme conspiracy theories. The Australian military is training to, uh, to turn against their own citizens, essentially. We had, in an alarmingly short time, created the echo chamber. If you're ready for the return of Jesus, like and comment below, come Lord Jesus, come. Like, follow, subscribe for more. On the home front, you've got somebody in your family. You can tell that they're conspiratorial and they're potentially spiralling. How do you deal with that? You know, if you've got a family member, the biggest thing I would say is don't confront head on. I think if you actually speak about conspiracy theories with someone who genuinely really is down that rabbit hole and does believe it, if you hit it head on, you will be automatically classified as the us versus them and you're in the them category. So I'd encourage people to have open conversations, try not to attack it dead on and just try to present some more open information. Um, but other than that, keep them away from being socially isolated. Bit hard though, the trans did not want to be with others. No, I, I do think this incident is a portal for all of us into another mindset. And I think to honour those two slain officers and the neighbour, it would be remiss uh, not to take it seriously, investigate it and hopefully potentially mitigate in the future. Coming up... Police constables, Matthew Arnold... The nation grieves. These two young officers, early in their career, full of excitement, their future limitless. And the police search for answers. And there was a couple of human beings that went out there to do the right thing and ended up dead. That's next on Under Investigation. Commissioner Katarina Carroll, APM, in space constables, Matthew Arnold and Rachel. There are moments in time that make us one. Often in joy and celebration, but also in shock and grief and disbelief. So it was with the cold-blooded ambush and murder of Constable Matthew Arnold and Constable Rachel McCrow. And Alan Dare, who died simply for being a good neighbour. Oh, mate. You're a hero. The terrible ordeals of young officers Keely Bruff and Randall Kirk. On the morning of December the 13th last year, we were one. In the aftermath of a tragedy, we reflect on what we've lost and what we've learned. I want to acknowledge the work of all of those who attended the scene. These two young officers, early in their career, full of excitement, their future limitless, and I just see them walking down this brown dirt road into their own deaths. I was with the family uh, the, the day after it actually happened, down in the beautiful seaside town of Kayama, south of Sydney. I was with my children, 
And there in the front yard of the local little police station was an officer who was raising the flag to half-mast. It was incredibly moving. And this would have been replicated across the nation. And it was a microcosmic example of the tragedy and, and the ripple effect of that tragedy. And it was in, in, incredibly heart-wrenching to see that. Tonight, we have considered the awful events the nation witnessed on that terrible day. The tragic loss of lives in the name of extreme religious beliefs, fanned by online hate, leaves policing specialists in Australia with a new dilemma. How do we police it? How do you predict when these thoughts then become actions? And from a We've investigated this new threat of an enemy within. A direct threat to social cohesion in Australia's communities. How difficult it is to predict and prevent. They are the people that can end up committing something without anybody knowing they were going to do it. In a world where seemingly ordinary people... People want the bad guys to look like bad guys. We want the grubs to look like grubs. ...are choosing to be terrorists. I think this hits on every Australian's fear that this is someone that you know. Well, this, this moment happened. This terrible event occurred and it stopped us. What do you think we have to take away from this? I think we need to have an appreciation of frontline policing. That's, and I, I don't want to just talk on police because this affects the whole society, but I think we have to have an appreciation of this is what frontline policing is, is all about. And I sit here and we're looking at the photos of the young police officers. Two people lost their lives. And uh, I think if the community can appreciate this, and this is a, the policeman in me saying it, don't just look at them as a uniform. They were a couple of human beings that went out there to um, yeah, do, do the right thing and ended up dead. And I think we could all learn to be just vigilant. If there are little indicators, nothing certain, but the more information we have, the better. So if you've got someone that's acting a little bit strange or has said something that's a bit, bit concerning, perhaps pass that information on to uh, someone in authority. Tamara, psychologically, from your perspective, how do we deal with this? I think from my end, it's investment in the research and the psychology behind what we can do and how we can do it and making sure that the decisions we're making are based on the research of what we know works. A lot of this is going to come down to prevention, which means things that we'll never know whether the outcome did in fact work. Um, and one of the things we invest the least in is always for prevention. John? I think that we need to take great pride as Australians about all of the, the amazing things that were done that day by amazing Australians. The neighbour who went to lend a hand that's four police officers who turned up doing their duty to serve their community. Whether that's a young officer who's being hunted while there's fires, whether it's the cert guys and tactical guys coming in to do their job. Um, you know, it is a fantastic story in that sense, out of tragedy of, of, of some really great Australians. It denies the ability of, of, of those who want to do harm to social cohesion in this country. And Matt? I, I'm with um, everybody at the table, but I'm especially with Gary in that we do have to remind ourselves these were two young human beings with their entire life ahead of them. And they work in the world on our behalf for us and for our well-being and the safety of our families. It would be a, another tragedy if uh, people who were considering a career in law enforcement were deterred by incidents like this. I mean, I think we have, as John said, take away the courage and, and grace that came from this tragedy to embolden people to actually step forward and go forth into the community like these two officers. Thank you all very much. This is not an easy conversation. And I think we should pay our respects to the two officers who did uh, lose their lives in this horrific event. I'm Liz Hayes, good night.
Hello, I'm Liz Hayes and thank you for watching Under Investigation. Subscribe to our channel now for exclusive clips and don't miss out on full episodes of Under Investigation on Nine Now and the Nine Now app.